If you had the opportunity to start over, to try things again from the beginning, would you don the phoenix's coat and be reborn from your life's ashes? This is a story about a man who did just that, who dared to tread his own path, who shed his previous existence and followed his soul to another world, a deranged enthusiast who was reincarnated as a vending machine. Moped Man is obliterated by a vending machine and awakens in a forest. He tries to scream, but he finds he can only produce generic voice lines like hello there or thank you very much. As a dedicated lover of vending machines, he quickly recognizes that he has metamorphosed into the very object of his passion. He is pleased by his new form, then ponders his existence and practices his voice lines at the wildlife. He discovers his isekai points, which are generated whenever he sells an item. The disembodied voice of God declares that he may spend his points to acquire various things and upgrade his personal statistics. This is a known standard for reincarnation. He tries out his sick new powers in excitement, but finds that he must use his points as fuel for his mechanical body. His discovery causes him to be worried about his current customer base. A frog emerges from the water to engage in racial violence, decreasing the machine's vitality. More frog. He panics then cleverly flips through his internal dialogue to uncover anything he can use to survive. He erects a barrier, launching the amphibians. However, the sentient rectangle is still under attack and is consuming points rapidly. He heals, but remains worried about his unknown fate. Days later, a stacked little girl emerges from the foliage and laments about her lack of sustenance. Well, 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 what do we have here? A magical box which trades coins for food. She receives a warm soup. The machine is pleased, and his customer goes for seconds. He gets to live another day. For some reason, the girl falls asleep in a clearly very dangerous forest. It's okay though, because our protagonist has morals. She thanks her metal savior and finds out that he can talk, or at least kind of talk. She reveals that there is an expert on magical items called Hulami who may be interested in his condition. She then introduces herself as Lamis, and they construct a system for yes-no communication. They converse about their situation, and Lamis uses her Herculean strength to heave the box to her village. They take a snack break with some potato chip. The protein princess is fleeced of her pennies. Lamis returns and introduces her find to the guards, who tell her that she technically owns him now. Apparently, they all live in a dungeon. The watchmen partake in the vending machine's ample delights and are stripped of their precious shackles. Lamis and her cool trinket rescue a lolly with sausage hair from a gang of hooligans. Lemon is chronically clumsy and inaccurate with her fists. Lamis is attacked by her friend, Munami, who was worried about her safety. She then introduces her machine. Her intention is to teleport to the surface to visit Hulumi, but she now lacks the funds to do so. Munami, a staunch saleswoman, suggests that Lamis and her magical box temporarily work at her inn, while Lamis requires the funds for transportation. The unsophisticated palate of the average medieval pleb cannot resist the cultivated flavors of modernity, and our geometric hero is overwhelmed with customers. He does some market research and changes stock. The guards are shook. They consume the soup and they're once more pilfered of their coffers. The magical box refined his sales technique over the next few days, changing inventory frequently. He is bullied by the baguette lolly. She is just a sundere, probably. Lamis acquires a saddle for her treasured item to ride in. The pair converse and Lamis bestows the name Boxo upon the vending machine. Boxo is pleased. An actual bear. The director of the Hunters Association has heard tale of Boxo's logistical prowess and intends to acquire his and Lamis's expertise for an upcoming holocaust on the frog peoples. Boxo is concerned about the consequences of sparing the amphibian civilization and decides to partake in the genocide. On the pilgrimage to battle, a renowned group of adventurers discuss the joys of slaughtering inferior races. Their leader, Captain Cariel, decides to quaff on the finest of Boxo's beverages. He is captivated by Boxo's characteristics and summons his depressed mage, Philmina, to investigate. She doesn't sense any wizardly power from him and confesses her ignorance, to which Colonel decides Boxo must be some weird anomaly and dismisses the significance of the unknown. 
Boxo flexes his economic dominance by producing cup noodles. The camp is stimulated and fleeced. Brother Bear informs Lamis about her option to participate in the upcoming battle. Boxo declares his lust for bloodshed, and Lamis is resolved to acquiesce. On the day of the battle, the terrain and weather are unfavorable. However, Lamis finds that with Boxo's weight, she is able to actually land hits. She is inspired. The company of soldiers is overwhelmed by the volume of frogs. Boxo makes a cube and confuses the women. He discharges another. Kyle is intrigued. The skirmish is won, and spoils are retrieved. The captain gaslights his group into pursuing the vanguard. Boxo expresses his displeasure at Cariol's greasy behavior, but agrees to go to the front lines. Boxo plays the role of support by producing sports drinks for the injured. The band of adventurers call themselves the Menagerie of Fools. Paddington Bear discusses the unexpected number of frogs and presents the possibility of Frog Chad, the Dominator, appearing. Lamis and Boxo are chilling with the injured when a felon makes an attempt at robbery. He is incinerated by Boxo's special move, Hot Soup. Lamis eviscerates the would-be thief. Frog Chad awakens, as foretold. The caravan attempts to flee with Lamis spearheading the retreat. Boxo ideates furiously. He decides to use the raw destructive power of Cola in Mentos. Lamis has difficulty deciphering Boxo's riddles. The thief from earlier is waterboarded by one of the injured for being insolent, and they discover Boxo's intentions. Giga Frog is disoriented by the stream of soda and is slain by the menagerie of fools. They rejoice. The director apologizes for his folly and thanks the platoon for their service. The army returns to find their village in ruin. Lamis is distressed, but is reassured by Boxo. They find the corpse of a big worm further into the town. All is well other than some haphazard destruction. Boxo becomes sentimental and distributes his wares at a discount in celebration. They partake in the worm's supple flesh as well. Lamis is intoxicated and expresses her admiration for Boxo. The next day, reconstruction efforts ensue. Lamis is proficient at heavy labor. Kyle has a shady proposal and is rejected. Some economists arrive to inquire about the decline of silver coins in circulation. Boxo is used as an ATM to convert gold into silver. The convicted criminal bears witness to the accountant's exchange and entertains larceny once more. An old man loses his life savings to Boxo's gambling function and is euthanized by his wife. The dynamic duo are summoned to the association to discuss business. Barrington Bear and a prostitute proffer Boxo for contraceptives in light of the village's growing populace. Boxo and the hooker are delighted. The small Sundere, Miss Suori, has destructive desires and is arrested by her wranglers. She returns and Boxo bequeaths a juice upon her. She's confused but thankful. Standard onsen's shenanigans ensue. Boxo provides modern luxuries for his primitive customers. The gambler from before imparts his knowledge of wagering upon the vulnerable youth. Boxo is pleased. The formidable furry solicits Boxo's adeptness for a covert task and tells him to prove his capability by becoming invisible for a day. Lamarise is insulted by sausage hair and we find that Suori intends to purchase Boxo for her own devices. They compare breast sizes as is anime tradition then discuss Boxo's strange humanity. Despite being classified as an object, Boxo is pleased. Swarthy flees in defeat. Boxo reveals himself to Lamis, frightening her. Boxo admires the dungeon's ecosystem. Despite being abducted by criminals, he reflects on his current situation and considers violence. He doesn't have Isekai Point to partake in such pleasantries, however, and instead settles on recording the perpetrator's faces. The criminals get frisky and are fed canned bong water. Boxo is delivered to a brazen little girl residing in a dark mansion. She intimidates the goons and introduces herself as Hulami, the magic item expert. Hulami was abducted as well. She reveals that her captivity was likely meant to force her into analyzing Boxo. 
Hummus is excited by the magic rectangle, and Boxo is pleased. They converse about his metaphysical properties, deducing that he is probably a human soul shoved into a magic item, and Boxo displays his cool powers. Hulami is enthusiastic. The miscreants attempt to set upon Hulami in revenge while she sleeps, but Boxo seduces them with the hypnotic allure of nudie mags. Boxo is pleased with the result, but disappointed by the assailant's simplicity. The next morning, Boxo provides a lavish breakfast of various dishes for the famished Hewlert. She is tasked with extracting the cash from Boxo's metal bod and is given two days to do so. Meanwhile, Boxo contemplates escape while providing essential beauty and health products. He is pleased. Hulami has no intention of fleeing and states that escape would be suicide given the location of their imprisonment. She feels that the best option is to wait out their custody and promptly falls asleep. The Hunters Association launches an attack on the bandits to retrieve the two captives. Huey reveals that the gang was hiding explosives in the room overhead and the association's onslaught may cause a death nation. She was right. However, Boxo erects his translucent god prison, preventing their pulverization. A convenient bag of coins falls from the heavens, allowing Boxo to go all out. Hulami begins to suffocate from the lack of air, and Boxy becomes a respirator. She is seduced by his heroics. Lamis falls through a crack in the rubble, and the prisoners are saved. Lamis sheds tears of joy. The menagerie of fools discuss Boxo's unparalleled importance after the rescue. Boxo produces is a milk in contentment. Lamis punches a fish in a flashback, recalling the days when she was persecuted for her supernatural strength. She dreams about her magic box and experiences bliss. Hulami reveals how she and Laminance were the only survivors from when their village was destroyed by monsters. Boxo is inspired and vows to be of service to Lamis. Hulami moves into the village during their reconstruction efforts. Tuari proffers Hulami for assistance and isn't rude for once. She specifies that there is an upcoming item flaunting competition amongst nobles. Suari wishes to hear the muffled cries of her rival as she watches her hubris burn to ashes from Boxo's superiority. Boxo, the ever virtuous, cannot withstand the promise of abject hierarchical brutality and agrees to offer his help. Boxo prowls the battlefield with his perception and spots the enemy. The foes engage, exchanging battery after battery of ferocious blows. The event begins. This guy invented a stick. Everyone's items are absolutely pathetic, except for the enemies, which is a cool robot. Hulami is suspicious of illicit activities. The soul of the damned residing within its metal carapace begins to writhe. It goes on a murderous rampage, but is derived of its chaos emerald by Huberi. She recites a poem over the robot's limp husk after its destruction. The crowd recognizes Hulami, who is notorious for the calamity her products bring. Boxo laments his uselessness in the corner. Winter has arrived, and with it comes a new series of challenges. A council deliberates on an encroaching threat, a new restaurant chain called Chains, which holds dominion over the free market. The councilwoman reveals their secret weapon, Boxo, who then goes to scout the enemy. Boxo is implored to work for Chains by the restaurant's proprietor. Lamis disembowels him for having the audacity. The meager offerings by the underdeveloped Developed medieval cookery cannot compare to the luscious baptism that is only felt through the consumption of cup noodles. Boxo realizes that their contemporary food doesn't use spices. The Council of Domination prepares samples to strategize, and Boxo produces a superior dish for every recipe. The chefs are in ecstasy and learn from their results. The free market returns to its intrinsic temperament as competition instills change. Chain's proprietor flees in shame, and his restaurant is annihilated shortly after. After. Captain Karaoke once more solicits Boxo and the chief of the Swole Patrol and is rejected for being suspicious. Karaoke gaslights Boxo into feeling guilty for saying no and our courageous quadrilateral reconsiders. The friends discuss the captain's proposal and Lamis confesses her desire for strength. Boxo is inspired and poops out some nice flowers for her to eat. Boxo reflects on Lamis's confession when a flighty woman uses him as cover from the police. The next day she is caught, but not sequestered, just flustered. The bald man and new lady flirt. Boxo decides to intervene because she has no riz. He gives her ingredients to make that bald fella's favorite soup. Boxo is startled to see she has eyes. Caillou is bragging about his cool new GF, and Boxo retaliates by unleashing his signature move. 
Flamis and Boxo's quest with the Menagerie of Fools will involve culling the Crocomen. Hubert warns the pair of the potential awakening of Big Boy, the Lizard King. They all, including Hulami, depart via wagon. Frogular ambush. Boxo produces a projectile for Lemis to fling. She misses spectacularly. They partake in Boxo's otherworldly bounty. Boxo teaches the women how to poop. They rejoice. The adventurers enter the Lizard's territory and send out the little guys to scout ahead. Their reconnaissance yielded the location of the enemy's base and their population. Hulami comments on the ecosystem's balance and deduces that something is off. Philomena becomes feral at the thought of interspecies extermination and requests that they take care of the crocodiles now. Hulami suggests that they fight their adversary in the morning. Bosco and Lampus share a brain cell. On the eve of battle, they discuss strategy. Boxo cleverly implies the use of ice to smite the lizard's thermoregulation. Hulami has twisted thoughts. Boxo unleashes a massive load into the river, incapacitating the reptilian populace. He then switches gears, producing dry ice to generate a brisk fog. Kyle's fragile ego is shattered in the face of Boxo's superior intellect. The Menagerie of Fools wheelie into battle. Hurley and Brocco converse about the various anomalies in the dungeon's ecosystem. All signs point to the revival of a dungeon lord, a boss monster that is said to drop some pretty sweet loot. Big Boy, the Lizard King, awakens and gives chase. Lemon is unconscious. Boxo turns to do battle with Godzilla's autistic cousin. He becomes red, increases his toughness, and is yeeted. The valiant vendor ejects chicken nuggets ferociously and is swallowed whole. He begins to cause havoc by poisoning the lizard lord and filling him with gas. He self-motivates and goes for the kill by heating a can in a microwave. The fragile crocodile is skeletonized. Boxo receives a cool coin and is then sucked into an abyss. His last thoughts are of a grieving Lemis. And that is end of part one of Reborn as a Vending Machine. Hello? Uh like and comment if you enjoyed the video, subscribe and click the bell icon if you want to see more, and uh, sign up to my Patreon if you feel like it. I'm trying out doing these in two parts, so part two is coming, or incoming. I had another video lined up for this week, but um, it's currently in a copyright dispute, so I can't publish it. Uh, thanks for watching all the way through. Bye.